Good morning, everyone. Th thank you all for coming back to honor one of the most important people in Whitman's history for a number of reasons. Um, someone who has been involved in the community for, for decades. And so when the opportunity arose to honor and celebrate the lifetime legacy of, of Dean Emeritus Mel Stith, um, we said, let's do this. Let's bring them back. Let's make sure we can have a fireside chat to learn from Mel's excellence. Without the fire. Without the fire? So I, I, I think the fire is going to come on in the back uh, on those two screens. Um, it, 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 it is still September, right? So yes. Yeah, the fires in Syracuse use yet. Um, I'd say most of the people in the room know you here as, as yeah. Dean Emeritus, where you were Dean at, at Whitman for, for a number of years. But what people maybe forget or uh, don't know the full story was that you were also Dean at Florida State for many years. Um, you were in the Army for many years. Uh, you were interim president in Norfolk State. Um, when you were in Vietnam, you, were, you reached the, the rank of captain. And you were also on multiple boards, uh, Beta Gamma Sigma, which is the International Honor Society for Business, the Jim Moran Foundation, Sonova's Financial, GMAC, Aflac, Keebler Foods, among others. And you were also nominated to the Hall of Fame for the PhD project. And tonight, from Syracuse University, you're gonna receive the 2022 Military Veteran Alumni Award. That's part of the Oral Central event. So, after having all of these accomplishments, this tremendous career spanning multiple decades in, in different forms of leadership, is there one particular career accomplishment that you're most proud of? Yes. What is it? <laughs> I'm marrying my wife. All right. Well, so that's great. So we, we, uh, we have Mrs. Stith here, Patricia. We have your, your son, William, here. We have your oldest brother, Pete, here as well. So yeah. that's great. Well, I didn't invite him. He just kind of showed up. <laughs> no, no, free food. He'll 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 travel from Virginia here. No, seriously, yeah. I mean, uh, I I think everything starts with family and friends, and I think that was the big thing about Syracuse because you talk about me coming here, but what you know, uh, I grew up in the South in the sixties where things were very segregated. So going to Norfolk State undergraduate where I'm at Patton one of 10 kids who uh, grew up on a family farm that our family owned for years. And then going into the military, then coming here at a majority institution, even though you've been in the military where things are somewhat constructed because people have to respect rank and privilege and all of that stuff. But then come to Syracuse. So what you really have to know about that, when I came to Syracuse, I had never been on this campus. So I was actually in the jungles of Vietnam and. Patricia and a good friend of mine who was here in, in uh, graduate school, Officer Scott, did all the work. And I was down, uh, I was in a captain of military intelligence. So we would gather intelligence because um, Nixon had decided to uh, go into Cambodia and we were along the wall, along those borders, and uh, we'd get the teletype. We didn't have all the sales stuff with a teletype to say, Captain Stiff, you have a full scholarship to Syracuse University but we have to get you out of here fast because it starts in the summer. If, if, you, if you want to take it, we'll send a helicopter tomorrow morning to pick you up, to get you out and get you back to the States to, to go to graduate school in three weeks. And so it became a whirlwind. They picked me up, we came, I came back to the States, uh, came here and was sitting in a graduate class clinic like three or four weeks later with Dr. Uh, Veda. And I'm saying, what the hell, Vietnam wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> going through regression and all of that but but what the essence of that story really is that from the time I arrived and then we stayed well within Maris through the housing part of South Campus uh, Patricia and I had a son uh, we always felt that Syracuse was, was a community that we ought to be in and the university treated us that way met a young professor named uh, Clint Tankersley and who has mm -hmm. since become a lifelong friend so it was just it was just we found it was a place to be now, coming back to be the dean was a little different because I had been at Florida State for a long time and I actually had decided uh, to step down. I've been the dean there 13 years and I had commissioned a white paper by the faculty to see what you want to be, how do you want to put this in place and went to Montreal again and made the mistake of going to Clint. I can't remember, it was lunch to dinner with Clint, Patricia, Susan, and I. And she said, you know, we could be looking for a dean. I said, no, you know, you ought to be thinking about that. I ain't coming back to no damn snow clip. You know, 
I'm a Florida Southerner. I'm a Florida gentleman. And we started talking. I actually didn't get into search. And what happened was William had graduated and was thinking about going back to school. And he said, I've gone to NYU. And I looked up, I said, William, but if you really want to think about radio, television, film, you got to look at Newhouse at Syracuse. And then we were, he was in Philadelphia. So we will meet you in Syracuse and just take you back to the campus. And clearly, I don't even remember, we were over in, in the other building. And I came, and they had made the offer to a gentleman to come. And the day before I came, he called and told Deborah Front, Deborah Front, who was the our provost and vice president of academic affairs, that he wasn't coming. And I showed up the next day. And so I said, Pat, I'm gonna thank her for all the kindness. And I went into the uh, business building and cleaned about a swami. So you gotta talk to us, you gotta talk to us. And I said, okay, give me two weeks. And uh, I'll go back, I'm here with my son. I don't want to mix that. And, and Pat has said, if you get in Newhouse, William, I'll put a thousand dollars in, in your uh, annuity funds. Well, William got into three programs. So <laughs> Patricia had to fuck it up. So we went back and then we came back, Alex. And uh, so Pat said to me, if your alma mater thinks enough of you, they want you to come back to be part of their legacy and their history. At least you ought to talk to them. And I said, okay, I'll go back and I'll talk. Then I came back and we were uh, about to leave and Nancy Fenton was the chancellor. And she said, I heard you talk about the snow. She said, I'm gonna pay you so much damn money you can pay somebody else to shovel your snow. <laughs> I said, you're my kind of girl, we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just I I, I I I mean everybody in the room knows how how, how dear Clint is to me, but it all started because he said you just ought to talk to us, you ought to talk to us, and that's what I then and then we came back we the the uh, Guthrie laid the golden egg, Tom Foley and all you guys, people that were here and Peter you remember. I came back and all I had to do was dedicate the new building. It was already built, the money had been raised. <laughs> remember, Peter? With the first, remember, Lisa, the first thing we did was to set up there, dedicate. I said, oh yeah, this is good. <laughs> I got a new building, you know, we can, we can be off and running. So that was you know, how, how it all kind of came together. And, and uh, I had just a great time as the dean here. Great. Well, yeah. thank you. I know you had a lot of faculty, myself included, yeah. Mike Haney once. Yeah. Time, and another couple of people looking around who, who came in in that era yeah. as well. There, Joe yeah. and Julie and yeah. oh, lots of people. Okay, yeah. what's my thought here, Sue? Yeah. So yeah. obviously, it's been a transformational experience, especially well, people. Well, it's, it's more important. So I know that we hired good people, and they became committed to Whitman, and that's that's the important piece. You know, if people raise their hand that they're still here, because we know how volatile the academic community can be with people trying to. Uh, uh, actually still good faculty members. So uh, we are just happy with our, our Cara and everybody that's in this room. Uh, to me, the blessing is that you're still here at, at Whitman. And then you're part of the fabric and you're becoming part of, the, unfortunately, the senior faculty that, <laughs> <laughs> that continues to grow the, the institution. Okay. So you mentioned one of the most important things is friends and family. So right. you grew up, you're one of 10 siblings. Yes. Um, in Virginia, yes. on a farm. Yep. And one of the things you were quoted as saying is leadership is about being responsible for things. Yeah. So knowing your family situation, how did that really, you know, where did you start to recognize that your leader? How did that start to to manifest? Well, what did you, you start really realize? Some of us, probably other people in the room, if you grow up on a farm, you have chores. You have to feed the pigs. You have to feed the chickens. And it's not every other day. It doesn't care if rain or shining. You have certain obligations. And you do one of the great things, and we own it on that. It was a great farm uh, that you learn uh, that you have responsibilities in life and you have responsibility to others. Now, our responsibility with our parents was with, with the 10 of us growing up on, on a farm. And they, again, in the South in the 60s, what our parents said to us, education is one thing nobody can ever take away from you. I don't care what happens. And so all 10 of my brothers and sisters have college degrees and most have master's degree. They've done and gone. But our parents, and my, cause our parents got married at 17 and 18 and there was no television. So it's 10 of us, you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and so, but seriously, you, you, and you don't forget that, that, that become part of who you are. You're responsible. Certain things that depend on you. And of course, when you're on a farm, poetry and, and, and animals become part of your food chain. You know, 
So, and then, then, then they were very, I used to tease my mom and say, you know, if, if uh, parental uh, uh, controls and stuff was in place, you would be in jail where you treated us sometime. And she said, well, I had to have order with 10 children. And she was right. But you learn that order is important. And your obligations to others is, is the most important thing that you, you can have, the way you treat other people. The way that you want them to respond to you is just always so important to me. Okay. So one of the signature pieces of you know one of your accomplishments is that um, you co-created the PhD project, which was really supporting the development of young faculty of color and opening up a lot of doors for for underrepresented minority students. Right. Why was it important for you? Because when you when you look in at, at business schools especially, there were many uh, people of color, or even at that point, even women teaching in, in colleges of business. It was kind of, you know, James Brown said, it's a man's world, right? And we said, what can we do to make a difference? And so I was at Florida State at the time, and Brandon Milano was at KPFG. And you have to also, I also think you have to realize your space, and everybody has a space. Every academic institution has a space. You know, and so when I looked at Florida State, I said, look, we're going to have a great undergraduate program because people can come as 6,000 undergraduate students in the business school. OK, you can have a you're going to have a master of accounting program. You can have an MBA, but it's going to be reasonable. We're never going to be Harvard. We ain't going to be that. So don't even act like you're going to be that. But where can you make a difference? And then to me, it was in the PhD program because you had the funds, you could allocate the funds, you could recruit the students that you wanted to come in. And what really set it off for me, one day I was in the elevator and this young guy coming out, I always ask the students even here, how are your grades, what are you doing? And the young African-American guy got in the elevator, he said, I'm doing fine. I said, you got all A's? He said, no, he said, well, why do you care? I said, I'm the dean. He said, you're not the dean. I said, I am, it's okay. I said, okay, come to see you, I'm behind those doors. So two days later he showed up, he said, you really are the dean. I said, yeah, I tell you. But then said to me, this guy didn't even see you know, the African-American as, as being the dean of a place like Florida State. And he didn't have any professors in the classroom, you know? And I'll tell you, <laughs> there was one, one person, one uh, African-American guy teaching at Florida State in the business school when I came. He was in marketing in my department. And I fired him because he, he was being used, in my mind, as a diversity tactic. And they didn't care whether he was on campus or teaching or not. He was all over the world doing all other stuff, but they could always check off a box. And I told him, uh, come fall, you have to be in class in front of the students here at Florida State. He said, well, I got other stuff to do. I said, I'll tell you what, if you don't show up in this class on the first day to teach our students, I'm gonna fire you. He said, you can't fire me. I said, try me, okay? And he didn't show up. And I had it fired until the day of fact, said, oh, Melvin, we can't do that, you know? But he started teaching. And because again, you, had obli you have obligations. And his obligation wasn't to check a box to make Florida State look good. It was about serving the students, the young men and women who came to Florida State to be students in our program. And I believe the same thing here. And, and another thing, I clearly remember Dave Wilder was in the elevator one day when I came here and he said, I'm doing that pass. I don't know. He said, well, never might not think the same thing. Dave said, he said, oh yeah, we have a new chef in town, don't we? He said, yeah, you got a new chef in town. Uh-huh because people ought to be here teaching. If you're part of Whitman, and I know we had all the great study abroad programs, but the essence of the young men and women who come and trust their future with us. And so we need the best teachers and the best people in front of their classroom. I heard a great story this morning. I haven't met the young man about uh, teaching statistics, right? Lisa was telling me, and how the kids love him because he has dedicated himself to taking a subject and making it something students can embrace. And that's what, you, that's what you have to be as a faculty member. That's what you have to be as a dean. As a dean, you, you're more external. You go out and you try to raise the funds to be able to do the things that we ought to do in this building and have the research portfolio, uh, portfolios and, and, the, and the money to do the research. That's what deans do, you know? And that's what faculty, so the faculty members have that obligation to be great in the classroom and, and to do the great research. Okay. So one, one of the things that uh, a dean does, and certainly you've had multiple positions in the military, academic institutions, corporate boards. But when you think about the most effective leaders that you've seen, what are kind of the the traits, the characteristics, the approaches that stand out as being that's that's the best type of leader that you've seen? Trust the people you hire. Trust them to do their job, and don't try to be 
that person. So when, when Peter was chair of finance here, I didn't want to be finance chair. I trust Peter to do that. When Joe became chair of accounts, Clint was my senior associate dean. I didn't want to be those jobs. I trusted them to do that. I didn't want to micro, micromanage anyone. So trusting people to do their job is the most important thing because you're going to build the confidence and people are going to see the way you treat one person is going to permeate the way people think you're going to treat everybody. So the way I treat you or Alice when you came will send a signal to all the other young faculty members that, well, this is the way he's going to treat us. Because here's an, here's an example. So every time you make those decisions, you have to do that. And that's why you have to be able to stand up and say, here's the reason I made those decisions. When I left Florida State, there was a guy named Phil Downs. Phil and I got along, but he, he, when he came to me, because we would disagree more than we got along. But he was, when I left, he came to me, he said, I want to tell you one thing about you. He said, we would disagree. I wanted to teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You made me teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and all that kind of stuff. He said, but I never felt that I had to back out of your office because you would stab me in the back. And that, to me, is one of the greatest compliments I've ever had as a, as a dean. We can disagree, but that disagree, disagreement is here. And I learned that, actually, from a guy who was the dean of the business school many years ago, uh, Robert Cox. Peter, you might remember when Bob Cox was the dean here, right? And, and Bob told me, he said, Melvin, everything is about that moment. It is not about tomorrow. When you have a disagreement with the person, it's about that particular subject. When that subject is closed, you move on. And you don't hold it, grudges and stuff. And he, he taught me that as, 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 when I, was, I left here and became his assistant professor. And I said, well, what does an assistant professor do? He said, you're a little rat learning to be a big rat. And what he was saying is, you're learning tools of the trade to become a dean. And he treated me that way. And he kept me involved in a lot of activities. But it was the, there was that trust part and the way he would conduct the meetings. He could be arguing with the person, get up and go to lunch with them. I would scratch my head after this. Thought, How can you do that? He says, it's about the moment. It's about the subject matter. It's not about the totality of, of, a situ of the relationship. Great. So if we focus on the issue of trust, have you found that there's ways of building trust, especially as a, as a new leader, as an emerging leader, sometimes it takes time to, to get- You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And what I, and you hear that all the time, but, but the way, Alex, the way I first met you or talked to Mike Haney and other people, men of the young people in this room that we try to hire, when you sit in that office and I talk to you and said, this is the way I'm gonna treat you, this is what we expect. You got to tell the truth. And when you build that trust from the beginning, then you have it. And then you got to make sure you, you try to live up to that at the best that you can. You know, you don't do flowery thing to try to make people to come because people, as you're finding out, I'm sure very quickly, people will be unhappy. So again, you go back to this truth and trustworthiness. And say, this is the way you're going to be. This is the way you're going to be. You know, this is the way we're going to treat you. And if someone doesn't treat you that way, you come and see me. And then we will, we will try to resolve that situation as, as best as we can. Great. Thank you. So another piece, a signature piece of your accomplishments here at Whitman is the creation of the Entrepreneurship Bootcamp for Veterans. Uh, so Mike Haney, who, who's here, uh, sh he generally likes to share a story about how he created this very fancy PowerPoint presentation with lots of analyses and spent hours and hours on it. And he wanted to come in and convince you. And you didn't want to see his PowerPoint. You basically ignored it. And you said, go ahead, start this. Yeah. But then Mike told me it had to be free after I agreed to do it. He didn't tell me, <laughs> he didn't tell me that up front. No, but, but again, you go back to good people. And, it, and, you know, I, and, you know, I was a veteran, right? So I, I could see the value of marrying veterans with a great entrepreneurship program. That's always been one of the uh, brands of Whitman. And so when Mike came in that way as a young assistant professor to talk about that, I just thought it was a great idea. I, I really did. And, and we have seen it. But again, you have to do that. So again, hiring good people. And Mike and I talked about it this morning. And Clint remembers. Mike, and I'm not saying that because Mike is sitting in this room, but Mike Haney was so good at his interview. And I knew he had an offer from the Fisher School at Ohio State University. And I said, Clint, we're not losing this guy. Mike Morris was chair. Some people, we all remember Mike Morris, right? <laughs> and, and, and I had Betty Hans, remember Clint, to write a letter, I, 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 a, a, uh, an awful letter to Mike. And I said, 
uh, uh, Mike Marshall, the last thing you do when he gets out of your car back at the airport, you give him this offer letter. I hadn't gotten approval, no thought of no, I said, you know, I'll fight through this. I'll put my career on the line. This guy is that good. And the results of Mike's leadership and all the things he has done to mentor Syracuse University, as they say, the truth is in the pudding. And, and the people in this room, when we saw you, people at this table, we said, we want you, Whitman, we are going to go to the mat. And I'm going to do that. And no rule is going to make me lose somebody to LSU, to NYU, and to these other schools where we wanted them here at Whitman. So I would break the damn rules all the time to get people. But it, it worked out in the end because they were, it was the right decision right. to make. Okay. But and, and we all know uh, under Mike's leadership and the embracement of, of the Whitman community, the Syracuse, the veterans throughout this country, what their program and their mentor, not just to Whitman or to Syracuse University, but what the program has meant to veterans in this country and how it's expanded into, into other programs under, under Mike's incredible leadership. Great. So if we, we, if, we, if we take that to another level, so you're talking about making the right decision being in charge, breaking the rules. At the same time, you're balancing that with being known as a collaborative leader. Yeah. Is is there a disconnect or how do you kind of bridge those, those no, two? Because I, no, because I, I treated other people the way I wanted to be treated. I wasn't being rude to anyone to have somebody go over the paperwork and make sure every I was dotted and T were crossed. I wasn't being mean or disrespectful. I was just being doing what I thought was in the best interest of Whitman and the best interest of Syracuse University. And the best interest of Whitman is to get the best faculty you can. And the, and the best interest of Syracuse University is to have the best faculty and the best students. So when they leave this private school, they, we, as, as a dean and as other people, go out and hit on them for money. But if they haven't had a good experience here with good faculty, they ain't gonna give you a damn penny. There you go. I waited in line for the registration officer. I waited in line for stop by coffee. You know, you hear that stuff when you go out. So you want the best people. And if you have to be a little assertive, and I'll say this to you, you know, as you seek day shifts, you, 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 you have to do that to build your shop and be and then be able to defend what we do. And Clint would know we would go to central administration all the time. We would defend what we did because we said it was the best interest of Whitman. You know? And, and then you do that and you don't be afraid of your job. Because you have to say, I'm going to do this. And if people are going to threaten you or do other things, I'll tell you another story. When I first got here, we were in a council of days meeting. And we were, I was talking to someone about enrollment or something. And, and the VP for academic affairs said, uh, Melvin, you're new here. You'd better stop talking because you know you could still be on probation. And you know what I turned to him and said? I have one request. And he said, whether I should get me out of here before the first snow falls. Because I can get a gig. Getting a job is... Because you got to do what you think is best for your institution. And what was best, I always thought what was best for Syracuse was best for Whitman. And we were very collaborative. We started a lot of joint programs. I know Whitman has continued to do that with Newhouse, with Maxwell, uh, uh, with our uh, military program. We have started these collaborative. So we always was collaborative, but we weren't going to let Whitman take a second or third place to Maxwell or to, or to Newhouse. No. you know. And the other thing is, we knew. At the end of the day, one thing we knew, we had the student volume that paid the bills at Syracuse University. So we were, we were funding, and, and rightly so, the arts programs, the dance programs, and that's part of a university. But we knew at the end of the day, they needed Whitman because of the number of students we bought. And we always made our classes with great students. And, and Clinton was then Dean of Undergraduate Studies. We, we always met our roadmen targets. So we knew we had a financial basis from which to go to central administration and, and have a position of strength. We never went and asked. We asked for more money. We, the more money we asked for was our money back because we had generated those funds through tuition and programs. You know, and they have a little sweep across the top that they do. They still do that, by the way. They still, I know they, they do that. that. <laughs> Some things don't change, Alex, in the something. academy. Some things don't change. So uh, apparently it's reported that your favorite quote is you have to be where your ship comes in. Yes. What does that mean? And why is this your favorite quote? Think about it. You just heard me say I grew up on the farm in a little town in Jeff, Virginia that still doesn't have a stoplight. 
It was a, 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 a community of family farms. Would I have expected to be sitting here? Would I have expected as a young black guy in the South, going to a one-room school with one teacher for seven grades to start, who is still our friend to this day, Mrs. Law? We keep her in the family because she was just out of uh, getting her degree from A&T. She's still living. Would I be expecting to be the Dean of Whitman at Syracuse? Would I expect to be the interim president at Norfolk State? Would I expect to be serving on eight major corporate boards? No. But it happened because we took a chance. Again, back to Syracuse. So when I was in Vietnam, Patricia and Oscar did all the work. I got admitted to UVA. I got admitted to Virginia Tech. And we said, Syracuse could be different. And as a young married couple, if we're going to make it, we ought to be able to make it on our own. And Virginia would have been safe because family. So, so coming here was where my ship was. And I say that to students. When you're looking for jobs, you know, and we used to get that here, here you know, the student, oh, I got to be in Boston. I got to be in, NY, in New York. I got to be in Chicago, in, in Florida. Oh, I got to be in Miami. I got to be in Tampa. All the big no, you can be in Iowa. Okay, there are good jobs. There are good people everywhere. So you have to go and expand your life and, and, and take advantage of those opportunities. And, and, and what I feed off that is I tell students all the time, when you come to a, a great university, you have to take advantage of things that are new and different to you. If it's a young African-American kid and all that person is used to is, is hip hop and rock, well, maybe go to a country music concert. You know, if you're, if, if you're, if you're a, um, uh, uh, a liberal or conservative, Go hear another speaker. And, and, and a good example of that, back to my corporate boards, the person that got me on most of my corporate boards is a guy named Joe Beverly. Joe Beverly is one of the most conservative, engaged guys in the state of Georgia. Joe and I served on corporate boards, and he has recommended me for so many boards. And we had just really good friends because we didn't let politics get in the way. Of that. So the example was when Barack Obama was officially inaugurated as president, not inaugurated, but announced as the next president of the United States. Pat said, I'm sitting on the, on the couch crying, drinking wine. Who was the first person to call me was Joe Beverly. Joe Beverly called me and said, Melvin, I'm very proud of the United States and I'm very proud for you and I'm happy for you, but you know, I didn't vote for him. <laughs> but he, to this day, so you, you, you get out, you, you, what I'm saying is you be where your ship come in, but you, so you meet a lot of different people. And everybody doesn't have to think like you, or act like you. That's the way you're going to grow. That's why you got to be where your ship comes in. Go to different places, do different things, meet different people, because that's the whole concept of the ship to me. And it has worked well for me. So one of the, one, you know, today we have a few undergraduate students yes. here. They're first year students from some of our, our best incoming class. They've been yes. here for a yes. month, maybe five weeks. Who's counting them? Uh, <laughs> They're yeah, back to, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're hovering around Mike. Yeah. So, uh, with with some young people in the audience, we have people in, you know from faculty, from staff who've taken on leadership roles, who've had tremendous commitment to the university um, that aren't always you know appreciated by others. But what advice do you have to emerging leaders, whether they're you know eighteen year olds, whether they're mid career people, um, that they can really do now to make a difference? Work harder than the person sitting next to you. Dedicate yourself to excellence in everything that you do. Be involved in activities other than the classroom because that's where you're going to grow and meet people as you emerge and learn your leadership skills. You're going to learn your hot spots and spots that you need to work on. Just be engaged. But remember, the academics is important. But I think the social skills that you develop by being engaged in, in, in the different student-based organizations, you, you develop your whole person. And so then when you leave, you, you'll have a lot of different situations to uh, reflect on. Once you get out in corporate America graduate school, you're going to meet another set of people. You just have to outwork them and dedicate yourself to, to outworking them, whatever that might be. But also at the same time, you have to maintain a good social part of your life. And more and more corporate Americans are asking people, what do you do in your spare time? How do you spend your time outside of work? Because they want to know, are you engaged and are you being in, engaged with people? And then you, you'll, you, you'll have really, I think, really great careers. Yeah. And, and women are going to prepare you to do all of those things. But you have to meet the professors halfway with your questions, with your ideas, 
and, and then on campus being engaged in the many different activities that a Syracuse uh, university is gonna offer you, whether it's student government, is is Bay Alpha Psi, it's the marketing club, is the, whatever those organizations are on this campus at this point. And not just the social ones of fraternities and sorority. Yes, they're important. Because I joined, we all do that as undergraduate students. But beyond the traditional fraternities and sororities, be engaged in the other activities on, on, on this campus. And I know uh, Syracuse has a uh, a tremendous study abroad program. If you can do that, that is great. But once you're in those countries, learn about the culture of those countries, learn about the people, learn about travel. How did that company, country become what it is today? Learn the history. And, and that just expands your world and it expands your horizon. And you don't have to be in New York. You don't have to be in Boston again, okay? You don't have to be in Chicago. Because when these firms come to look for you, they have offices all over the country, all over the world now. And take advantage of those things. And sometimes the best growth opportunities are not in the major offices in the major cities. It's in medium-sized cities and other, other places where you're going to grow. And actually, you're going to be exposed to more uh, of that operation of that company because you might have to do multiple things because of that location. And they'll find you where, wherever you, you can be in Davenport, Iowa. They'll find you. You know, they'll, they'll find you if you're good. And then they'll bring you back to where you need to be. And remember, your first job is not going to be your last job. Uh, you, you're going to be very mobile, and there are a lot of just opportunities. So take advantage of those things. Yes. Mel, I wanted to make sure we had the audience ask some questions as well. You've known many of these people for decades. Um, so I, I wanted to give them the opportunity to put you on the spot and ask some hard questions. And I see Lisa, 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 Lisa Knitch put her hand up right away. Yeah. So I think you, maybe as an axe to grind. Yeah. <laughs> But one thing that he shared that is kind of intertwined with what he said, but I want to say it out loud, so it's more of a statement than a question, but he said, don't, I think it was in a faculty meeting, but he said, don't ever forget the people who turn the lights on before you get here, and the people who turn the lights off after you leave. And I've always tried to live my life that way, but having the leader say that, and like every, once a year, he and Patricia would have um, dinner for all of us, all the faculty, all the staff, all the significant others. But that was his recognition that everybody was part of the family. Yeah. And I think that's such an important thing for all of us to remember that, I mean, he addressed a lot of comments to us as faculty, but he believed we were all part of this family. And I want to thank him for that. And I've tried to continue to- oh, you're very kind. We, would, we would have a party for every worker they came in this building, remember Lisa? Yes. They did anything. And when I first did that, Clint, remember, we got called from the main cruise. Well, why are you doing that? You can't, we, and we let them set the menu. We would have a little gift for them because they made this place representative. And while we were here, this was the only building that the chancellor would have her board of trustee meetings in because Whitman looks so good. But it's because that person that cleaned the bathroom they knew they were part of the Whitman family, you know, and we would bring them in. If they came in here and we would call and, and, and what the uh, 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 staff started telling me when they came to work, they said, well, does Whitman need anything today? We, we, we were the first one because we were the only dean, the only person that would bring them in this room, sit down and have a lunch that they could choose what they want to serve and Barbara and all of everybody in, in my office were there at the time, and Betty and, and Clint and all of us, we would make sure that in every time, everybody, we got the number, we had a gift bag that they took out of it because they make this place run. We come in and we teach, we do those things, but we don't clean the bathrooms. We don't keep the floors looking good. We don't keep the walls with, with stuff on it. It's, so everybody's part of the family. It's not just a job title. And I like this, I just believe that very strongly. And I guess I think that's part of my bringing up in the South because African Americans weren't always treated that way. You know, and I'll just give you an example. So I, you heard me grow up on the farm. My grandfather had two farms. One was like 450 acres, another like 90 in Mobley's. On the farm in Mobley, he had white sharecroppers. But you know what? When my grandfather went to town that Saturday, that guy who lived on his land had more power and more thought than he did. 
because if something went down, it would have been my grandfather who wouldn't have come out of it so good. So it taught me, you better treat people good. I don't care where you go or what you do. And they're all part of a family. They're part of their family. Other questions for Mel? Tyra, please. I think you've addressed it a little bit, but you know, faculty can be a little cranky. How do you keep smiling? <laughs> <laughs> Walking around the building, you know, Well, I kept a bottle of Crown Royal in my office. <laughs> no, no. It's a serious, Tara. Look. Everybody has a right to their opinion. And everybody should, have, and we know, everybody should have a right to express what they believe. Because what I think is that people think what they're doing is in the best interest, maybe, of the institution. Of the, I mean, we could question that sometimes. But, but you give them that audience. And again, remember what I said. And once that conversation is over, it's over. You know, that's why we used to always have a little party after faculty meetings, remember? Where we could chug a lug a little bit to just get it out of the system and let people totally relax again. And don't leave here being angry or upset. You had a little social hour where people could rebond together. We could disagree in this room during meetings, but that's how we got better. You know? That's how we got better. By, by sharing diverse opinions, by having a discussion about those opinions, then coming to, to the conclusion to do that. And then I always felt that it, when I made those decisions, I had to explain to faculty, to people, to students why you made the decision that you made. Now, they don't have to agree with the decision, but at least they understand why, as a dean, I made the decision that I made. And, and so that's, that's why I can, I can smile about it. Yeah. Because it was never personal with me. It was never personal. It was having that discussion, having that argument. And that's why, I, you know, when I was here, I had an overdose policy. If I was in that office, you could walk in that office. It was really important. You could have an appointment. But if not, you could come and we were going to have that discussion. That's what was important to me. And it still is to this day. Yeah. Other questions for Mel? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I don't have a question, but I do for all the faculty that were here when we all came. Um, there was always a feeling in the building, and you could see it rumble through the building that Mel is in the building. <laughs> as soon as he walked in the building, and he was over talking with students and faculty, and you just kind of felt his presence throughout the building. And that was fun to do. Well, you were my partner in crime. Of all people, you were my partner in crime. And you would tell me, well, man, we don't do this at Syracuse, you know? You know? <laughs> we would have those conversations. That's clear to me. We would sit down and, and have, have those conversations. And, but that's what you had to do. Because, women, no, because Syracuse and women was so special to me. You know, always will be and, and, and always has been. And that's why it's, it's, it's just like, it's like a joy just being in this building and seeing people that I care so deeply about it. Don't have to see a Wagman down on the mask, you know, and, and, and uh, get to say hi and, and have fellowship and, 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 and be glad to see each other. Because to me, with the Clint Wheels up in Slocum Hall and the old builders remember, and uh, it was, but it was always, always a special place. And I stayed and got the PhD program because I was ex-military and intelligent people were, um, Miller was a bill of new brood. They were somebody told me, said, Melvin Miller wants you so bad, they're going to dump a wheelbarrow full of money at your door to get you to come and work with them and all that stuff because of my military service. David Wildman came to me one day and said, Melvin, you ought to stay here and get your PhD. I said, Huh? What are you talking about? He said, I think you would be a good college professor. Why don't you think about it? And I went home and talked to Patricia. Oh, we can do that. And that's that because he, and again, the way you can intervene in somebody's life. Because I was married then, we had a, our, our daughter, Lori, who had been born. We had two children finishing up, ready to go to corporate America and what, take the world by fire, right? Getting all kinds of offers, offers um, 
again, because of my military history and intelligence and all that stuff. And um, David Wildman stopped me one day. He said, come talk to me. I think you're going to stay here and get your PhD. And El Richard Arlica was the day then. And he said, we'll take good care of you. Don't you even worry about that. We think you ought to stay here. And another African-American guy, Charles Chuck Evan Clint, you remember Chuck was here. He said, Sandy, and, but, so Chuck and I got together with our families. Said, if one of us stay, both of us are going to stay as a pack and get our PhD here. And we both stayed and we both got our PhD. But David Wildman, if he hadn't stopped me that day, I would have signed with some corporate company and Procter Gamma, Cincinnati Marketing, shaking tide and joy, you know, <laughs> and doing labels or, or drinking a lot of beer at Miller Brewery, you know. Uh, but, and that's, and that's, I think that's, again, I'll say the fact that it's, I, you can so intervene in one person's life, you don't even realize the impact that you might have, you know. By, by just saying, you know, you can do this. You can pass that CPA exam, you know. You can, you can do the market analytics. You can do that stuff, you know. Yeah. And, and one last story. I had a young guy who was a PhD student. He said he went home and he was uh, sitting at a breakfast table and, and he would say, oh, mom, this, that is so hard. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. He said, his mom looked at him and said, I don't know a damn thing you're talking about, but you're smart. You're going to get it. Don't worry about it. And he said that just calmed him down because his mom had confidence that you're smart enough to do this. And, and, and those things make a, just a big impact on people. What you say and the way you treat them goes back to what Lisa was talking about. It just has an impact on people. And you want it to be positive. Thank you. One more question. Willie Reddick. Yeah. So more of a statement. Um, and Mel knows about this. And we talked about all this. Clearly, it's highlights and accomplishments. But a lot of people don't know, he actually was one of the founders of the PhD project. Um, and with that said, he's the only one that has over 14 students of color that he has confirmed PhD degrees in the history. And I don't know if Bernie told you that. Yeah. You're the one that has 14. He has six at Florida State, eight at Syracuse, me being one of them. So, thank, thank you. you. Yes, it was easy. Well, and, and I think I think that that also epitomizes what we really want to celebrate, and that's your legacy of inclusive excellence and all the tremendous initiatives you've had, your leadership, your way of bringing people together, and importantly, how you've treated others. I think that's kind of the recurring theme from hearing your stories, hearing from our colleagues here. So we we all have so much to be grateful for for your inclusive excellence, your leadership throughout many decades to Syracuse University. I'm delighted you're receiving that award this evening. Uh, on behalf but of you the didn't tell about the most important award, right, Mike? That is Saturday. I am the hometown hero at the football game. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to fill a halftime and we're playing the mighty ducks of Wagner. Okay. <laughs> so so that's that's gonna be fun. But no, I would like to Alex reverse that. And for me to say thanks to you and the people in this room, the people on Zoom and other places who couldn't be here, that you dedicated yourself to Whitman and you believed when I tried to recruit you and people around this table, that I was telling you the truth, that you could have a good career at Whitman. And if you hadn't brought into that, then I couldn't be sitting here, okay? So my thanks is to you. And the people that are still here who are working hard and that Whitman continue to grow and all the good stuff I read now online with Allison and people that, that sent us this stuff. And I do read it, you know, every day I do because it's really important of what you're doing, right? And under your leadership and the people in this room who dedicated themselves to whatever your role is at Whitman to make it a better place. That's what make a leader. The leader doesn't make themselves the people that have you fulfill those dreams and to work hard to do that. So my thanks is to the people in this room and on Zoom and other places. I got emails from people that I can't be here today because, you know, other things. That's what makes me a better person because they, people have dedicated themselves to quit. And so the thanks is, is from me to you, uh, a collective you, uh, because we all have now made Whitman a better place. Thank you so much, Mel. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. We have a small token of appreciation as well. 
Allison put this together with lots Ooh, of new, thank new, you. new Whitman swag. Okay, I appreciate it. The, uh, the older stuff. Oh, oh, it was great. good to see everybody. It was really thank great. You. Thank you.